real life, snakes are honestly fine. A little slithery, kind of hard to read, but broadly inoffensive. But there's something about them that just tickles the imagination, you know? You can't walk five feet these days without tripping over a mythological snake with crazy anomalous properties. Maybe they're the feathery forefather of humanity, or a many-colored harbinger of rain, or an eldritch abomination aiming to devour the sun, or any number of other slithery boys wending their coils through human mytho history. Something about their sleek design just speaks to us, you know? But while mythical snakes span the whole moral spectrum, if there's one title that just screams evil, it's Serpent King. Nobody good has ever held the title Serpent King, and if you want proof, let's go back about a thousand years to the opening chapter of the famous Persian epic The Shahnameh. Written by the poet Ferdowsi between 977 and 1010 CE, The Shahnameh, literally the Epic of Kings, is the national epic of Greater Iran and a very, very important piece of literature. It's also long as balls, but conveniently subdivides into a lot of smaller stories for easier consumption. Here's one of them. So the story begins with a quick rundown of some ancient mythical kings and all the cool stuff they did. Mostly important civilization things like inventing clothes and fire and irrigation, you know, basic stuff like that. This line of kings does pretty well for itself until it produces Yamshid, who does really well for himself. So well, in fact, that he decides he's basically God and starts having people worship him. This is generally considered to be unwise and has some unintended consequences. See, in Zoroastrianism, to put it very simply, the Earth is basically a constant battleground between the forces of good and evil. Specifically, it's a proxy war between the beings of Hura Mazda, creator, deity, and ultimate good guy, and Angramanyu, later called Ariman, the source of all evil and creator of various evil spirits called Devas. Not to be confused with the Devas in Hinduism, very different concept. In this model, it's the duty of humanity to do good and bring happiness because it bolsters the forces of good and helps in the cosmic battle against Ariman. In contrast, doing bad stuff tips the scales the other way and empowers Ariman to do more bad stuff. Now, by the time the Shahnameh was written at the turn of the 11th century, the dominant religion in Persia was Islam, which had locally overtaken Zoroastrianism a few centuries earlier. So the poet Ferdowsi was writing from an interesting position. The ancestral Iranian religion of Zoroastrianism was no longer widely practiced and some of that culture was in danger of being erased. So similar to how the prose Edda frames the Norse gods as something old and distant, the Shahnameh is framed mythologically while still actively preserving these ancient and culturally significant stories. But anyway, long story short, Yamshid does a big no-no and in the process tips the local cosmic balance towards evil. Ariman gets a nice little power boost and starts sniffing around to cause some mischief. So he zips out into the desert to the kingdom of Thasus, ruled by the wise and just King Mirtas. Now Mirtas has a beloved son, Zahak, and Ariman rolls up to the palace disguised as a nobleman and tells Zahak that he should enter a covenant with him, and if he does, he'll raise his head above the sun. Now Zahak is a nice boy, maybe a little bit gullible, so he thinks, Willikers, mister, that sounds pretty nifty, and agrees. Step one, kill your dad. Zahak doesn't really want to do that, but eh, a deal's a deal, so he and Ariman set a trap for Mirtas and kill him. Now Zahak is the king of Thasis. Nice. Ariman teaches him some nifty magic and encourages him to be evil, but Zahak's not all bad. He's not a great king, but you know, he's trying his best. So Ariman changes tactics and zips around the back to change out his Groucho glasses and enters the palace in a different disguise, this time as a young man who offers to be a cook. Zahak doesn't see the harm in it and agrees. And Ariman wastes no time in whipping up a meal fit for a king. Specifically, he changes the formerly vegetarian menu to include meat. And Zahak is so impressed by this dietary shift that he has the cook summon before him so he can grant him a boon. And Ariman asks only that he be allowed to kiss the king's shoulders. Well, we don't kink shame in this palace. Zahak agrees, and he probably shouldn't have because after the deed is done, Ariman is swallowed up by the earth and two venomous snakes sprout from Zahak's shoulders. Fun times. Well, Zahak obviously wants these snake shoulders out of his life, but they can't find any way to get rid of them. Enter Ariman version three, this time disguised as a learned scholar, who tells Zahak that the only way to tame a case of the old snake shoulders is to feed those bad boys human brains. Now obviously, having a king with snake shoulders who eats human brains is not so good for the kingdom. Word begins to spread about this absolutely terrifying snake king, which is actually good news for the people back in Persia who've been dealing with their own evil king for a good few centuries now. Rebel forces congregate in Thasus and declare Zahak the new Shah, and an army musters to march against Yamshid, who sees the writing on the wall and books it. He manages to evade capture for a good hundred years or so before they eventually catch him and saw him in half. Tough break, buddy. So now, Zahak the Serpent King, or as I've taken to calling him, Johnny Snake Shoulders, is the Shah of Persia, which is great if the goal is making the world an exponentially shittier place to live. Eventually, things get so bad that Ahura Mazda sits up and takes notice, and sets a plan in motion to get things back on track. Yamshid's got a few surviving descendants rattling around, and thanks to a little divine intervention, one of them has a son named Faradun. Not so coincidentally, that night, Zahak has a terrible nightmare where a young man kills him with a mace shaped like a cow's head. He wakes up and demands an explanation from his advisors, who reluctantly inform him that it sounds like there's a prophecy that he's going to be overthrown and destroyed by a man named Faradun. Well, you know how these evil king types get about prophecies. Zahak immediately starts scouring the land for Faradun. Faradun's mother catches wind of this and hides him in a forest, where he's raised by a magic cow called Permaya. Unfortunately, after a few years, the forest isn't safe anymore, so she comes back to collect him and heads off to an isolated mountain peak where a hermit can take care of him instead. And just in time, too, since Zahak finds the forest, learns that Faradun is gone, and gets so angry that he kills Permaya and everything else in the forest, turning it into a barren desert. Zahak continues to strengthen his army and search for Faradun, but that doesn't do his confidence any favors, and he starts to worry that he might be a bad king. No. What? No. 
Oh. So naturally, he demands his citizens reassure him that he's actually a good king doing a really good job. Obviously, they do what he says because snake shoulders, but dissent is beginning to spread. This comes to a head one day when a blacksmith named Kava marches straight into the palace and demands an audience. Kava's had 17 sons, see, but 16 of them have been sacrificed to the king's snake shoulder situation, and now his last son has been chosen to die too. He demands that Zahak spare his last son, and Zahak actually agrees. Then he asks Kava if he'll sign this official paperwork stating that Zahak is a good king, actually, to which Kava responds by ripping the paperwork into confetti and striding out of the palace while everyone is too stunned to stop him. He heads straight for the city square, tears off his blacksmith apron, and uses it as a banner to rally the people in rebellion and leads an army out of the city to go find the prophesied hero who will deliver them from the Serpent King. Give me this movie, Hollywood, you cowards! Meanwhile, Feridun has grown into a responsible and wise young man, returned home to his mother and learned of his royal lineage and his destiny to destroy the Serpent King. He's ready to fulfill his destiny and is frankly getting kind of impatient waiting, because he wants to kill the evil king now, but his mom says it's not safe to go alone, so he's gonna have to wait. This is around the time the massive army of rebels rolls up on the front line to ask if Feridun can come out and play. Now that they've got the manpower and the prophecy on their side, Feridun gears up in some kingly armor and has the rebels forge him a mace. And in honor of his old nursemaid, the business end of the mace is shaped like a cow head. Oh yeah. It's all coming together. So they march to the city, finding it actually mostly undefended, since coincidentally, Zahak is out with his army looking for Feridun. The people rally behind them and they invade the palace, defeating the Deva Zahak left to guard the place and setting Feridun on the throne as the new Shah. Now, Zahak is none too pleased about this when he returns. He and his army besiege the city and there's a very dramatic battle, which our heroes win. Feridun whacks Zahak with his mace and is just about to kill him when he's stopped by Sraosha, a servant of Ahura Mazda, who tells him to imprison Zahak on Mount Damavand instead. Feridun follows his advice and binds Zahak under the mountain for all time. And so, thanks to a prophecy side true king, a charismatic rebel leader, and a battle scene so ridiculous I literally cannot believe they haven't made this trope goldmine a movie yet, so ends the tumultuous tale of Johnny Snake Shoulders. With a thousand lies and a good disguise, hit him right between the eyes, hit him right between the eyes, when you walk away, nothing more to say, see the lightning in your eyes, see him running, 